The warmest of greetings to you, and welcome to Happily Ever Teaching. This is the podcast to help you enthrall your learners in every subject under the sun using the best teaching method known to science storytelling. To do this, we feature special guest educators who are passionately keen to empower your children. I am storyteller Chip Cahoon, and with me today is... Hi, I'm Rob. I work in a school just outside of Milton Keynes, and I've taught every year group from reception up to year six. And I'm Nicola, and I teach a junior school in Hampshire, and at the moment I teach year six children. I have also worked at Teacher Training College and hopefully enthused students to be fantastic educators themselves. And today we are exploring what maths we can teach with a folktale from the Indian jungle. You can listen to the story by downloading our sister podcast, Fables and Fairy Tales, or search our website, epictales.co.uk, for The Real King of the Jungle. There you'll find a video of me telling the story that you can share with your children. And if you sign up as an epic educator, you'll also get a copy as a paperback joyously illustrated by Winnie the Witch's Corky Paul, as well as the full audiobook for you to download at any time. Right now, though, let's continue our discussion with Rob, Nicola, Tendaway, and Loris as we start picking up the maths learning outcomes here. We'll, uh, let's start this time around with the upper end of the primary range. So ages seven to 11. Nicola, what learning outcomes did you find in maths from this tale? The time came up a little bit, probably mm. more to be discussed with some of the younger children, but obviously it kept talking about midday, things happening at midday. Um, but then I thought, well, I wonder if we could think about where jungles are around the world and obviously the time zones they're in and what time it would be in those time zones. I Ooh. think it's really important in, in learning to just make it worldly, to get children to expand their ideas of, of any concept we're teaching, but in the real sense of the world. Yeah. So, yeah, thinking about that. And that would come in then to the 24-hour clock as well. And that could give you a real um, opportunity to have lots of uh, extended mathematical word problems, couldn't it? If you Absolutely. Were... Exactly. Exactly. So, if it was midday in England, what time would it be in a jungle in, I don't know, um, Puerto Rico, mm. something like that. So, yeah, that was one idea. You could kind of turn them into two-step web problems by saying, what time is it in Puerto Rico? And what time is it in India where your luggage has just arrived? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, also thinking about um, comparing animals. So thinking about ratios, you could potentially look at the weights of some of these animals mm. and then compare them. Um, I say ratios. So you could, you know, how much heavier is the elephant compared to um, monkeys? Yeah, monkeys, bison, antelope. Yeah. So how much heavier are they? So you could do it, do a bit of ratio there. Uh, look at mm. look at weights and uh, compare them. Would that be something you could slip into the middle of the story, thinking about maybe the different meal options that Tendway has and which which you might want at different times and how full he might get? Yes, yes, you could do. But in terms of his weight changing, do you mean? Uh, well. Yeah, p possibly. Um, I, I don't think he cares about that too much. But of course, he, he is a leopard, so he's going to dangle his leftovers in the trees, isn't he? Absolutely. Absolutely. I was also thinking about the weights of the actual animals. You could do some research in them and then you could round the mm. weights up to the nearest hundreds of grams or convert it into kilograms, order the, the weights of the animals. You could actually have a situation then. I like what you just said there about Tenderway and how it, every time he eats an animal, he puts on this amount of weight. How much weight will he have? When he's eaten so many animals, so you've got a bit, almost a bit of algebra in there, sort of a, yeah. a, a simple equation that you could use that you could then work out if he ate a hundred animals, how much would he weigh? You could also sort of make it a little bit real life by having him burn energy whenever he is going after the animals. So if you, if yes. you instead of it being weight, or you you convert the weight into um, a calorie amount that he gains from that meal then yeah the activity that he takes is going to be uh, a minus away from that and this would then i suppose allow your children to investigate whether he is going to put on weight sitting down by the mahua tree waiting for one animal to come to him or whether he is actually going to start to starve and need to break the deal himself that's a good point and you could even put that into a graph i can imagine sort of a line graph there so you could actually analyze the data a bit better as well yeah that'd be really good i mean i think timesing by 10 came up in the script but i can't actually find it in front of me right now but oh uh, it's it's the appetite isn't it 10 times the appetite of lion that was it 
that was it. Because for ages seven to 11, getting children to be very confident at multiplying and dividing by 10, 100 and 1000 is really important. Yeah. And, um, and even by the time they get to 11, we still have mistakes in that. So using the times 10 concept and, um, and using that to help children to learn that could be a nice way forward as well. Yes, absolutely. That, that's an awful lot for uh, ages 7 to 11 to get their teeth into then. <laughs> Let's, uh... Literally, teeth in the jungle. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah. This is what the podcast descends into when Rob is here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, see what Rob has himself for ages 4 to 7. I've got some ideas for you to chew over. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, where my first idea is one that Chip will know that I like, and other people who've heard me talking will is counting the number of legs. <laughs> one of my favourite things to do in maths. But I thought I would match it up this time with rapid recall of number bonds. Okay. Which, similar to when Upper Key Stage Two, is a good. It's a good skill to be able to do quickly, or just mm. in any part of Key Stage Two. You're knowing your number bonds to 10 and 20 gives you that almost an advantage in maths. So yeah. thinking about the different animals that are in the story, oh, the leopard has got four legs. Four and what makes 10, for example? Mm. If there are two leopards, what's the missing number to make 10? Things like that. And again, you can differentiate the level of the problem depending on the age of the children you've got. You could have more than one animal or different quantities of the animal. Mm. So you could use it in a math starter, you could use it in the five minutes you've got between the end of literacy and lunchtime, or mm. not like a gap fill, but just to keep children's minds thinking about those animals and their number bonds to 10 all at the same time. Yeah, and again, I, I'm, I'm thinking of ways that this could actually become part of the story so if, if you're finishing the story or you're in the middle of the story just before break time or something it could be tenderway's way of working out what he's going to have to chew on when they come down to the mahua tree or what he's going to have to chew on after swoosh and swiping two antelope and uh, yeah, one yeah. snake or, or something like that yeah yeah or hey, I've just eaten an elephant and now another one's in the story. How many legs will that make to get to 10? Yeah, does the size of the leg make any difference though? Uh, not in number bonds, no. Okay, I'm just thinking because most of the animals in this story have four legs, don't they? Um, I mean, there's a snake. There is a snake, yeah. Monkeys, do they have four legs? You could Monkey, argue. Yeah, are monkeys, are they legs or, or arms? Yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> Same with lorises, I suppose. <laughs> and red pandas. Yeah. So yeah, you, there's a bit of a bit of play. Yeah, <laughs> um, that could link nicely onto times tables as well because I know there might be just fours. You've certainly by the end of the story, they know they're four times table, but also eight times table. <laughs> you could, you'd, if you've got four elephants, then you've got a sixteen times table. You could almost look at patterns with number as well. Yeah, excellent. I came up with another idea as well, and this is to do with uh, short straws and long straws, mm. and it was to do with finding out how long each straw was that they picked so a bit of measurement and i would start off with well i think with all of the children i would get some bits of straw and get them to measure them in different ways so i'd start off with cubes measure it in cubes to start off mm -hmm. with, with my four to five year olds and then i would still use those in kind of year ones but then i'd start looking at rulers as well with my year two so just building up that knowledge of how to measure accurately which is, as with everything we do on this, a key skill. And yeah. It's thinking, counting legs, measuring, all important things that we need to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you could set, with your, with your more able year twos, you could start setting questions. Uh, how much longer was the elephant straw than the bison's? Mm. So a bit of problem solving in there as well. And you could do that with your younger children as well, but I might do that as a class or mm. as a group rather than going away and doing that individually. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would definitely help with their kind of mastery of understanding the longest and the shortest. I would make sure I was using lots of that kind of vocabulary mm -hmm. right from reception and then up to year two as well. And you'd have longest and shortest straws that are 
perhaps quite obvious uh, in the first few instances, but then if you produce straws that are only just you know, like a few millimetres shorter than the other, you can imagine there being arguments between animals who don't want to be eaten. Yeah. <laughs> so they might be uh, yeah. encouraged as part of the story to, you know, prove that they have the shortest straw. And again, then you've got it as uh, something that's within the world of the story and going to really motivate the children to do the investigation. Yeah, yeah. That's sadly all we have time for in this episode, folks. If you'd like to talk to us about anything you've heard in this podcast, or if there's a subject you are soon to teach that you'd like us to cover, you can find us on social media using at Teach Happily, or leave us a review using your favourite podcast app. Please also share this podcast with your colleagues and help us start a story-led revolution in classrooms around the world, so children everywhere can learn in a way that's effective, memorable and enjoyable all at the same time. Tomorrow, the animals of the Indian jungle will help us teach science. But right now, it only remains for us to say cheerio and we hope to hear your story soon. So, cheerio! And we hope to hear your story soon! soon.